Right, so as Greg says, um, there is a new macro expander coming um, in the next version of Racket. So uh, released in a month or so. Uh, for most programs, this is a pretty small bend in the road. Uh, most macros will still work. Um, if you try to use submodules in type Racket, they'll finally behave more like they should. There are some macros that will, that will not work well, particularly uh, if you have a macro that expands to a submodule, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, performance is about the same, memory use is about the same, the size of the implementation, if you just count lines, it's pretty similar, although I think it's uh, better code now. So, uh, so why am I so excited about it anyway? Um, I really have to explain what I mean, mean by macro expander to, to get at that. And this bit is a little bit redundant with Matthias's talk. It's a little bit in conflict with his talk because I call it a macro expander. Um, but what I mean is a, is a lot more than just define syntactual, right? So, you've got a module here. I'm sure that's what you recognize this module sitting out in a field immediately. Um, it's implemented in the language hashlang type bracket. And to talk about what ex the expander means to me, we're going to have to sort of go underground and see what's going on here. So, um, let's crawl under there. <laughs> and what we see is this program is being pulled apart and bits of the program are being sent off somewhere else. So that's the job of the macro expander, to sort of break the program down into fragments of the program and send them off somewhere else. Um, we'll just get rid of the ground because it's in the way here. Uh, in the case of hashlang type bracket, of course, it goes off to the type bracket compiler. So it receives these representations of the program, and uh, it looks at them and tells you that your program is well typed or it's not. And if it is well typed, then it will also work with uh, another little compiler for contracts, which takes some of the same fragments or some that type track it synthesizes, and it puts those together into generating some regular old racket code, untyped racket code. As those type racket, those pieces flow in. So somehow these different fragments of the program need to make sense when put back together, um, and then those get shipped off to the racket compiler, and maybe it's combined with some other module that's in plain racket, and so on. And um, well, of course, uh, you know that type track it, I've drawn it as a factory here, but it's really just another program. It has to be pulled apart and compiled uh, through Racket and so on. So you end up with, this is what the world looks like to me, right? All of these fragments of programs flying around between different pieces of our ecosystem, and all of those fragments need to make sense. And, well, there's more, so I'll just throw in a few more here, right? <laughs> it's the job of the macro expander to get these pieces in the right places and to make them understandable uh, to those pieces, to make them make sense and, and be put back together again. And, well, none of this is new, right? This, as Matthias was saying, was where we've been, and it's worked out very well for us. Um, but, um, oh, see, this is actually a picture of the old macro expander. And you see it's lost a little fragment here. I bet that was a submodule in type bracket. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, what's going on is we sort of built this system at the same time as we were figuring out what it was supposed to do. Um, and it was getting kind of pushed to its limits, and uh, that pipe there was starting to break. And the repair has turned out to be not so much fixing the pipes, but looking at what is a fragment of, of, of a program, right? What do, how do we represent that here? Um, we, you know, there's, there's been a model around that, that we've built on that's very, has worked well for us, but the places where the system was starting to get creaky had a lot to do with this having to reason about these things because, sure, it's an identifier like X, but then as these things flow around, they sort of change colors so that we can kind of track where they came from, except as they flow into other places, they get renamed, uh, and then maybe they change color again, and then maybe they get renamed, and that doesn't look all so bad. But then, um, then some things want to say, well, it wasn't actually an X, it was actually get X. So pretend it was get X from the beginning, so we have to keep the history of all of those transformations around. And this is what a macro implementer has sometimes had to hold in his head. And well, that's, you know, it, it was okay, it was workable, but it wasn't great. So we want something easier to think about than these cycles and epicycles and, and so on. So we're gonna go back and say, this is what the talk is actually about, you know, what is a better representation for these fragments of syntax? And the motivation is to make it work in this whole big world of cooperating languages and modules and so on. But of course, we can just go into one particular module because you can have local defined macros and um, but we can look at the problems there, and it turns out that that will let us talk about the problems that exist everywhere. So I'm going to pause those flying spheres and go over here. So let's look at some, some actual bits of code. Uh, so define x dot dot dot. Something happens in the dots there. 
Uh, what I'm doing there is computing a value that sort of counts as a pre-made value that I'm going to use in other places in this module, unless x is false, and then I'll do some other work. So you might say, why not call it pre-made instead of x? Uh, I'm just not going to be very creative with the variable names, that's why. Okay. So um, because I'm going to do this often, either use this pre-made variable, pre-made value, or evaluate some expression, of course, I'll make a macro, pre-made or. And it just says either x, or if x is false, then go do this. And it's a, a macro instead of a function because the work that I need to do if the pre-made value is not there may be a lot of work, and so I, I don't want to do it at all. Right? I'm sort of just making a macro to delay the evaluation there of E and, until I need it, if I need it. And then here's our use of it. Um, I've let x be some function to do a lot of work to compute a value, and then I use pre-made or to either get this x or call the x function to get the result. Okay, and you can see why I've been so uncreative with my variable name. It's to simulate the collisions that are inevitable in the, in the larger picture, right? Um, I can simulate them by being, uh, using x all the time here. So what should happen? Pre-made or is a macro invocation, right? So uh, we're going to match it up with this definition of pre-made or. Uh, that parenthesized x gets matched up with e in the pattern. And so where e appears in the template, it's going to come out as a replacement for the use of pre-made or. Meanwhile, the or and x, they are not part of the pattern, so they will come down as is. I've colored them orange here just so that we can remember those came from the macro expansion. It wasn't originally or and x there. Okay. Uh, and at this point, you can see a problem with the picture uh, because uh, this x still means the x that it should, but now I've got an x that uh, is not supposed to be captured there. Right? This is one of the classic problems when you think about manipulating syntax. I meant for this x to refer to my pre-made x. Um, and it's not that it should be the orange x because there are no orange x definitions, right? Still a blue x that it's supposed to match up with. Uh, it's not that I can treat x at the top level as somehow special because maybe this is not in the top level. Maybe this is in the definition context more nested in my program. You can write macros and macro uses uh, anywhere. So uh, they're the same kind of x. They're both local x's perhaps. And somehow I need to um, disambiguate this. And then, of course, we can do or is the classic macro example. If I have the definition of or, where I have chosen as my temporary name x, um, then when I replace the use of or here with the macro expansion, we get something that looks like this. I let x be the value of the orange x. If that's true, then I return it. Otherwise, I evaluate the function. And so again, I've got a different colored x. Um, here, I do have a green x, but then it's capturing this other one, and so on. So that's the kind of problem that happens in the very small scale. And there are various solutions to this that involve those color changing, spinning things. Um, I, I want to suggest that what has really gone wrong with this picture is not that I've used the colors badly, but that I've sort of relied on a 2D representation of the syntax, uh, really a linear one, right? But 2D and that I think of this x as being nested in there because really um, we, we see this 2D thing, but that x from the macro expansion is in a different plane than the code that it, at the place that it expanded into, right? And so I want to break out into a different dimension somehow, and that's maybe more on the right track than thinking about renamings. Um, so that's the, the path I'm going to explore here, but let's sort of step back again. What is it that we know that works? You know, how does lexical scope work and how does it fit into this picture? Um, so here's again another program where I've used lots of x's, but for, for variety I've used a y also. Um, what is the binding structure here? It, even though it's a lot of x's, you can pretty quickly see um, that this x means that one, and this x means that one, and that y means that one. That's what we're used to in terms of if you just um, look for the closest binding with the same name, and, and that's the one it refers to, right? No question there. Uh, there's another way to draw this picture, which I like a little more, especially for today, which is to sort of color, put a, a background behind the binding instance and then put a background between the whole region where that instance binds, okay? So it's the same sort of information. Again, this Y binds to that Y because it's on the same color. And this X, well, it looks like it's on a sort of light blue cyan, and that one's orange, but we know that uh, the orange is meant to extend uh, beyond all of that, right? So there are these different color planes, but in this case, in the case of lexical scope, it happens that they're all nested. Um, now, 
if I, if I want to make this kind of picture, a flat picture, have that same information to let you know that x is really orange also, then I can write it this way. It's the same information. This says x is in the pink and the orange and the light blue areas. Uh, and I've left the contours there just to sort of remind you where they came from, but they're not really important from now on. So you're with me? I'm taking this notion of binding scope and turning it into colors and a set of colors on each identifier. And what will I do with the OR macro? Well, those new pieces that come in, I will put a green background behind them. Okay? And you notice this let and this X don't have pink and orange and blue because it wasn't in those binding scopes. Okay? In other words, if we try to go back to this picture, it doesn't work anymore because you can't tell whether this green is inside the cyan. If I try to draw it in a 3D-ish way, then it's like these are nested, but this green came in at a different dimension altogether. It's sort of orthogonal to those planes, right? And that's not going to be any better to think about. But if we represent it as these just sets of colors, we summarize that information, then it becomes something that that's, uh, we can deal with, right? And notice also it's the colors that are in different dimensions, not the identifiers. This X is still nested in that let, and when I, I look at that binding, then I'll make up a new color for its binding. I will paint these things in purple, right, because those identifiers really are there, and that's how this gets bound. Right, but at the same time, if I want to say, what is the binding of this X, I need something that's compatible with pink, orange, light blue, and purple. This has a green, and I don't have a green, so I can't have been um, bound by that one. Um, but this X is compatible with that one because it still has pink. Sorry, this one is the binding instance. But this one has pink and orange. That's more, uh, even more compatible with it. Right? So there's a, a sort of subset relations on sets. Not sort of, but exactly. A subset relation on these sets of colors. <laughs> Uh, and I want to, instead of finding something that's closest in some sort of 2D or linear uh, version, uh, I want to find something that's closest in terms of having the biggest subset of my current colors. Right? So, and then lexical scope turns out to be just a, a, um, a special case of that, where all the sets have a certain nesting structure. We can take this. Oh, I should also mention that actually if, if the OR macro is in another module, then it doesn't really just have green, because green was from the macro introduction. It also has this, that module color, which is blue, purple, let's call it brown. Um, brown, uh, and that module would be the one that bound let. So even when I pick up this let, take it over into the other module, it still records that it came from some brown region where I might find a brown require that pulled let in from racket. Okay. Uh, so that's the basic idea. We can double check our original pre-made or example. I've painted it all blue now because it's all in some module. That's blue. Um, uh, so this X is the blue binding, this pre-made OR is blue binding, and now I see a let, and here's a new X that I'm seeing. So I make up a new color for that and paint everything in the body of the let with that new color. So I've got some, some pink attached to the blue pieces here. Now I get to pre-made OR. I see that it is bound by this pre-made OR binding here, because it's, it's compatible with the light blue binding. So that's still a macro invocation. I still match up the X call with E, so it still comes back down that way. And then the parts that I introduce, the OR and the X, I make up some new color for them, orange like before. Uh, but now everything is OK when we look at this combination of the names and the colors. So uh, light blue and pink is compatible with that, but not with this. So that means it doesn't capture, whereas I still find this X here, which has a light blue color, which is compatible with the, the light blue and orange, and is in fact the most specific binding in this case. So uh, you can push this through and try out more examples. There are uh, some catches when it comes to definition context where you can both define and use macros. But the idea with some extra, extra little rules about how you shuffle the sets around uh, works out really quite a lot more easily than the same cases in the old way of doing things. So when you go read the new manual or you read uh, write-ups about this, I don't call them colors. I just call these scopes. And so this uh, set of colors becomes a set of scopes or a scope set. And then we still have syntax objects. But now a syntax object is simply defined as um, the datum part, which is a symbol or a list or whatever, combined with a set of scopes. And um, you can read more about this here. That's a long URL to write down. But if you just search for scope set racket, I'm sure you'll find that. Right? So that is. Uh, you know, telling you about all the details, telling you what will change and what will not change, and 
pieces of that are gradually moving into the manual as well. So uh, if we go back over here and continue, then that means it's not perfect spheres floating around here. Uh, more specifically, it's identifiers with sets of colors flying around. And uh, you know they're flying around everywhere. And these, these sets of colors are basically the way that these different languages can cooperate and make sense of different fragments. Uh, that, that's sort of the public works view of things here. And that write-up that I pointed you to, one of its main audiences, other public works departments, right? Uh, other languages that have macro systems or need macro systems. Um, I think one of the obstacles for adopting racket style or racket scale macros has often been understanding this little core piece. And I'm hopeful that uh, we have a better understanding and that will let more languages, more communities adopt it. Um, but also, as always, you know, we want you right on that main line, uh, plugged into the, the plumbing there, so you can have fresh hygienic macros uh, right at your fingertips whenever you need them. Um, we're not all the way there yet, right? I, I, we haven't written the new macro system for dummies book or, you know, macros in 21 days. But maybe now that we have a better handle ourselves on how to reason about this, we can make all of this much more accessible. So, thank you. Great. Well, we have time for questions. And uh, unfortunately, I saw you first, and you're way on the far side. So can we have uh, cool 3D animations for debugging macros? And can we use your animations for continuations? <laughs> uh, I have not yet talked to Ryan about integrating the 3D view with the macro stepper. So it sounds like a good plan. Um, by the way, this uses pic 3D. If you haven't tried pic 3D, it's huge fun. Um, but I don't see why we can't uh, actually, uh, my student, Zhang Chi, she's in here somewhere. Uh, right, she's in, into debugging and visualization, so you know, maybe we should pull some 3D stuff in. Uh, so I apologize in advance for not having read the full set of scopes right up, um, but I, while you were going through the explanation, I can't quite seem to fit the model that you showed with basically what happens when you have something and it appears on the right-hand side of a defined syntax or a let syntax. and that really kind of munges your scope information because really there's two different dimensions on, on which something can be the same as an identifier, right? You've got the pre-identifier equal and the bound identifier equal. And I kind of really only see one dimension being represented there. So um, first, a clarification on the question. Are you talking about recursive bindings at all where you have let rec syntax or? Um, uh, just in general being on the right-hand side. So in the case of let, um, you see that blue, uh, brown, I really do know my colors. Uh, brown was the color chosen for this X binding, and you see brown was not added on the right-hand side. Um, and that's what let does. It doesn't include the scope on the right-hand side. Um, if it were a let rec, then brown would show up over here. I, I guess, no, I, I'm talking about as far as the difference between pre-identifiers. Okay, so going, so going now to the free identifier, uh, bound identifier. So what free identifier means is uh, would these two things, two identifiers, refer to the same binding? Um, and that's not a question you can ask independent of the set of bindings, so that's why in the implementation the, uh, and in the description there is a global binding table. Um, so two things are free identifier equal when they have the same biggest subset match for a binding uh, somewhere else. Uh, bound identifier equal is simply they have the same sets. Because bound identifier equal means no matter which way you use one binding the other, uh, one in a binding position, one in a use, they would bind each other. So bind it, binding identifier equals even more straightforward. But overall, in the implementation, these turned out to be way simpler tests than before. In your example, it looks like the, the thing that binds you is always a pref, not just a, a, sub, a subset, but a prefix of the colors of the, um, the thing being bound. Is that always the case or not always the case? Uh, that is not always the case. It just happens in this simple example. Yeah, so if we had, um, uh, well, let's see. I'm yeah, it's just not always the case is the, w is the way to say it. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. 
I think it's when you stash an identifier away and then pull it back later, which was always the complicated case that they can get out of order, and that's okay. So. The way in which you found the one that matches is you said pick the one with the largest subset that matches. Yes. If I got that right. How do you know there aren't two? Yes, there could be. That's why there's a new ambiguous binding error that you can get out of the macro expander. Um, and it's hard to provoke that error. You have to do things like stash the identifier away and pull it in. But there could indeed be ambiguity, and that is an error. And where I found that this showed up the most as I was uh, applying it to all our existing macros is macros that were broken, that I just didn't have formally move them, you know, try them out in the right context. But the ambiguous binding uh, error tends to, for reasons that are not entirely clear to me yet, this is all sort of new, tends to expose problems in macros. Does your paper write down an example of one of these ambiguous errors? It does, errors? yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's bigger than this, so let's defer it to the paper. Okay. Uh, well, I think we're at the point in our schedule where, uh, well, first of all, a big thank you for Matthew Flatt.